many, if not most, of today's big data companies are focused on problems that just are nearly big enough. And uh, they're generally focused on improving marginally, as, as, as it were, existing digital businesses. And the next biggest wave of opportunity, to me, will come from capturing and processing data that comes from primarily analog processes. So I'll uh, get into that in a second. But at PayPal, which I co-founded many years ago and was a CTO for the first four years, right after uh, we uh, got acquired by eBay, I left, we sort of pioneered that concept, I would say, by capturing human behavioral data in the transactional processing that we'd seen millions of those per day to gain such deep understanding of what people would do that were able to predict their intentions, sometimes before they knew their own intentions and could fight fraud quite successfully by turning away customers that had plans to uh, steal our or uh, someone else's money. So at HVF, which is the project that began in 2011, we try to create businesses that are based on the deep understanding of analog real-world data and uh, trying to improve lives by, by, by leveraging that. So let me explain what I mean by analog data, digitally sensed. Um, I sort of became aware of the concept of this analog to digital data gathering and processing after I tried to understand the success of Uber. So I, I, just like many people in Silicon Valley, I was trying to catch a cab, couldn't do it. A friend of mine pulled out their iPhone, and 10 minutes later, we were in this really nice black limo going to the place where we needed to go. And I was sort of amazed at the simplicity of the process and uh, how beautifully the whole thing worked. I since became an investor in Uber, so but this is not a paid advertisement, I assure you. The interesting thing about this business, Uber, and many others like it, is that it's based on this concept of taking an inherently analog process, which is a human being saying, hey, I need a car, I need to get from point A to point B, turning the need and the resource availability information into digital format, gathering it at a centrally placed queue reordering that queue, and this is very important, based on market data, mar that is pricing data, and they've now been pioneering dynamic pricing, adjusting the availability of cabs based on demand, and essentially charging people more when they're willing to pay for uh, more readily available cars. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. They are truly taking advantage of uh, of this notion that uh, analog data can be turned into digital packets that get reordered. Since then, the uh, collaborative consumption, which is a fancy $2 word for this, has exploded as a concept. So I think I made a list last night when I was thinking through this. Uber, Airbnb, Exec, Get Around, Postmates, Zipcart, Cherry, Housefed, Skiara, Tool Spinner, Snapgoods, Vayable, Swifto are just the businesses that I could find by clicking on the first link on Google when I searched for collaborative consumption. It's pretty incredible. It's not like we had a huge surplus of black cars before or today versus prior. It just, it, it, it's not like this, this just happened. So what enabled this explosion of uh, businesses? It's the to me, the fact that we've finally been able to, through the emergence of cheap sensors, which is very important, cheap analog sensors that live on analog devices but produce digital output, we're able to capture the slack capacity information about the real world. The real world is painfully inefficient. You can look around and notice that, stat of the day, commercial airplanes on average spend 10 hours a day flying, private jets spend one hour a day flying. These are planes, planes are planes, but somehow the privately owned ones just never quite see as much use. 
Airbnb noticed the same thing about uh, rooms and mattresses and spaces and nowadays yachts and places like that. The need data, people that wake up and say, oh, I really want me a, uh, a private jet or a, more likely an air mattress to stay overnight, up until recently had nowhere to turn. Today, you have mobile broadband, and so all they do is they roll over, pick up their phone, and start typing on the smartphone app. The modem, which is, an, interestingly enough, an analog device even today, is the enabling factor inside your smartphone, which is just smart enough terminal, as compared to dumb terminal model, is the juxtaposition of communications, cheap broadband, and a pack full of analog sensors that are capable of producing digital data. The requests for resources, now in digital format, are moved up into a centrally managed queue. Which is very interesting because I spent my entire college career reading up on distributed networking, distributed systems, which was all about bringing intelligence all the way to the edge, which proven completely inaccurate. Most of the intelligence, most really interesting developments in the last five years in data, I would say, are all about gathering data and moving it into the cloud for processing, understanding, pricing, et cetera. So this queue, which is kind of a cool computer science concept, also known as market or marketplaces and auctions or whatever you want to call them, are ultimately about capturing these analog packets, digital format, reordering them based on finance or financially explicit demand. Proof is in the pudding, and in the case of cabs and black limos, every time I get into an Uber, I ask the driver, what do you do? And for the last year or so, about half of them say, I professionally drive for Uber. That means that companies that own cars, because Uber doesn't, hire drivers now to only drive in this Uber model, which means that it's inherently more efficient both on the revenue perspective and resource utilization perspective. These analog resources that are normally flagging a car on the street are a lot more efficiently managed if they are captured and driven through these digital processes. The, to me, this, this development is nothing short of revolutionary because now that the queue can be managed centrally, you can truly improve the, uh, the way a huge number of amazing resources are utilized. You can sort of imagine a sinusoid of utilization curve of any resource in the world, and the peak is kind of over here, and the trough where you know, the, the driver's asleep or the jet is grounded or whatever is going on is down here. And up until now, no one knew. And now you have these amazing market forces between cheap sensors and cheap broadband, pulling up the trough, making the utilization as close to 100% as possible. Instead of making more jets and keeping them on the ground for 23 hours out of the day, we can just fly the same ones we already have, which I think is a very nice side effect of uh, not trying to pollute. So uh, I had a, a better example. The jet one came out a little bit 1% uh, or like, so I'll, I'll give you the 99% uh, oriented one. It used to be that every kid in a suburban neighborhood made money with a lawnmower that their parents owned by going over to the uh, house with the overgrown grass and offering their services. If it's not happening right now, there's somebody starting a company tomorrow that will create a smartphone app that uh, any suburbanite can schedule the available neighborhood kid with their own lawnmower to uh, come over and take care of their grass. So uh, digital resources will, uh, will become more uh, better managed through, uh, through, through digital cues. One other point about these kind of businesses is that defensibility of these businesses really rests in the same thing as most digital businesses, which is network effects. Once you have sort of a critical mass, it's cheaper to join the network than to try to create your own. In the case of these analog to digital queues, the network effects are actually of data. Once you've gathered enough dynamic data about resource availability, their need, and the pricing, it's pretty much inevitable that you know more than any one resource owner or the resources themselves would. And you can always price 
your services and the availability of these resources as cheap as possible, thereby driving any new upstart out of business. So this mode of operation naturally lends itself to creation of monopolies, but the good kind of monopolies that provide the highest service to the consumer. So what other businesses can we expect in this analog data-driven world? I actually think it's just the beginning. So my sort of favorite example is uh, off-duty cops becoming schedulable private security guards for neighborhoods that experience crime. So you can literally rebalance the availability of crime prevention, which I think is very powerful because the standard dodge is that you know, crimes are always happening when nobody's watching, police need to be where the crime's about to happen. Well, now you can have anyone in the neighborhood schedule an arrival of a squad through a smartphone app. Uh, another, my, my sense is that solving the uh, patent troll problem may come through uh, short-term patent license auctions, and uh, the litigators will be thrown in with the license. So, um, my favorite existing analog to digital centrally managed business is uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo and uh, AngelList, which are all basically the same exact business to uh, efficiently price and redistribute spare cash. So instead of handing it off to a guy in the street that happens to be closest to you asking for money, you should donate it into a digital system like Indiegogo or, uh, or Kickstarter and help finance a good project. We'll definitely see some uh, dynamically priced online available uh, priests for confessions, and uh, we'll probably see lots of uh, therapists that will uh, help us get over our, uh, our sins that we just confessed. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen for sure is, uh, this is maybe slightly in the future, but uh, dynamic pricing of brain cycles is already happening. Lots of consultants can be uh, had by the hour to help you with whatever problems your business or your personal life has, such therapists, for example, will be. But uh, the next, next version of this is a brain plug that will allow you to donate or to make a little spare cash on the side as you sleep. So today, if you run SETI at home or Electric Sheep or any one of these screensavers that grabs spare computer cycles from your PC to do some useful work and donate it back to a centrally managed system, that's an analog business or a digital one. An analog business of the same kind, of course, will be direct plug into your head. And uh, you can sleep and uh, contribute to factoring a very large product of primes so that uh, foreign codes can be broken, speaking of cryptography. Um, so the other interesting thing that uh, is worth mentioning is that there's a really neat symmetry in these kind of businesses. From analog to digital, there's also a digital to analog. One of the things that's going to happen as soon as the public is ready for it, most difficult human-centric tasks that are done at the edge of consumption, such as driving or flying, for example, will be done by the most efficiently available human at the center. So the sensors will be on the wheels and on the wings of the transport, but people will be safer because the person flying or driving will actually be at the comfort of their own workplace or perhaps home one day. And so the pilot that will land your plane in tricky weather will be the person that they pulled out of bed or pulled out of their cryogenic sleep, perhaps, to uh, land your plane because they are the best, smartest person. So the Sully, the guy who saved people by landing a plane in water, will always be available to save another plane. Um, so what, what's going to happen after this? So all of this is kind of a, a prelude to what I think is really interesting. The really interesting part is that these are all kinds of new modalities, and they're inherently fragile because there's digital and analog and analog to digital. And so humans are tricky species. We, we live in the world of errors and mistakes, and we're scared of things. And to us, all this novelty and innovation represents risk. And it's the kind of risk that we must take as a species. And the reason this talk is titled Data and Risk is not just because it's about risk pricing, which, which is ultimately the solution to these things, but it's the fact that we must take these risks. We have to advance, and letting a machine drive our cars or letting a human save our lives from remote is just something that we must do. To deal with these risks, however, we're going to have to come up with new kinds of insurance. And traditionally, insurance is all about finding the 1% of the events or the people or the customers that you want to be rid of, something that you don't want to have in your world. 
But to me, it's actually the exact opposite. What you really want is to focus on a 99% by understanding risk, by understanding the opportunity, putting the price on failure and the revenue number on success, you could ultimately allow people experience things or have the opportunities that they would normally not be allowed to do. To wit, you can look at someone's tweet stream, determine that they're a fiscally responsible 18-year-old and allow them to buy their first house on credit, which is not something that would normally be done in the universe of FICA scores and the traditional banking infrastructure. This is, to me, the most exciting thing that will be happening in the next 20 to 25 years. I think we will see a tremendous number of new insurance-like systems, systems to assess risk, systems to put a price on opportunity. And that's what I'm trying to do with my project HBF, which stands for hard, valuable, and fun, which are the three necessary conditions for me to be excited about something. The reason I'm so obsessed with this term analog is not because it's retro cool, but also because it's kind of a synonym for human. I think majority of businesses that are focused on big data today are too obsessed with building another version of Excel on steroids. And the interesting thing is to create opportunities for people to live their lives more interestingly, to have more exciting, more profitable opportunities for themselves. So I generally hate big data storytelling because that's what sort of mostly happens in every time people talk about big data, the first thing they want to talk about is how it's going to be amazing and they create this anecdote that may or may not correspond to reality. But in this case, I'll give you a sort of a, an example narrative, which I'll try to keep myself honest and actually spell out the things that I mean. So I, have, I happen to have two toddlers, and uh, on Saturday morning when I put them into their uh, respective uh, baby seats, I want my car to notice the weight differential. And I want the car to communicate through my smartphone to my insurance company and let them know that my driving has just become a little bit more risky. I now have two humans that are, I'm responsible for in the back of my car. And as soon as my car realizes that I'm driving within the speed limit, stop at all the stoplights, and never hit the highway, I want my phone to notify my insurance company. I want them to lower my premium. Moreover, if they don't, I want my phone to automatically pull every insurance company that offers a similar product and see if somebody wants to offer me the cheapest possible insurance with the lowest premium and the best coverage. I think that story, while still fits into the big data narrative, which is a little bit uh, anecdotal and certainly hand wavy, is actually doable within the next couple of years. And the only thing that's missing is the analog to digital interface from my wheels to my iPhone. And you know, with Audi sponsoring uh, this conference, I think someone is probably taking notes right now. So if you're going to start a business in big data, I really wish you would focus on the analog to digital to the centrally queued market-driven request management. I realize it's a handful, but I think it will uh, help make lives a lot better, and that's certainly what I plan to do.